Shalom, everyone. Shalom. I am very grateful for this chance to speak with you here in the Central Coast about Jewish Evangelism 101, a term that I'm very familiar with. I eat, sleep, drink Jewish Evangelism for the last 36 years, so perhaps some of what I've been able to accomplish and in which I've been able to participate will be useful for you here and wherever else God sends you immediately and in the long term. Let's see what we can do together. Father, use this time for your purposes, for your people here, and for your people with whom they'll be in contact in due course tomorrow, this afternoon, and decades to come. We trust you in Yeshua's name. Jewish people are like everybody else, only different. <laughs> or what was the old line? Jewish people are like everybody else, only more so. So when you think about Jewish evangelism, and you're here for the seminar because you want to learn that, I am already going to bypass the need to discuss why we should evangelize Jewish people. I'm going to bypass all the historical rejections, etc., by the community of faith nicknamed the church, and I'm going to uh, give away the, the need to discuss Jewish people's perspective of Jewish evangelism. And we're going to deal, because we only have 45 minutes, is that right? To discuss how you, as an individual believer in Yeshua, in Jesus, are supposed to take what you hold so dear and pass it on. That's why I figure you're here. Don't talk to Jews. Maybe that's the first thing you need to think about. Don't talk to the Jews. You know, the Jews all rejected Christ. You know, the Jews are all in Israel. You know, the Jews all are rich and have big noses. You know, the Jews are all... And they all live in Bondi. And the Jews... All... Anytime you start talking like that, you might as well be... Just put a big R for racist right there on your chest and um, maybe an eye for idiot, because uh, Jewish people are not all the same anywhere, everywhere. And once you start saying, I'm going to talk to the Jews, you're already behind the, the eight ball. You're going to talk to Mrs. Goldberg and Dr. Cohen. You're going to talk to Mendelssohn and Levy. You're going to talk to Jews one by one by one, unless God gives you an opportunity to go into the synagogue and address a, a multitude. It's just unlikely you'll be speaking one by one by one with Jewish people. So today we're going to talk about how do I witness what I believe and hold so dear with Mrs. Goldberg. Let's just start there. Jewish evangelism is different, not only because Jewish people are different, but because of our natural negative commitment to the person of Jesus. Those of you who teach scripture in school will have opportunity to talk to somewhat Christianized young people. Not necessarily Christian, but not hostile to the gospel. Their parents are not necessarily hostile. Go to the class, it'll be all right. I, draw, I used to go to Sunday school, I don't believe any of it, but you go to that class, youngster. You ask most folk here in the Central Coast or over in the Hunter about Jesus, and they may not necessarily believe, but they will likely not be hostile. You want to believe that, it's okay. You don't want to believe it, it's okay. You ask Mrs. Goldberg down in St. Ives or in Caulfield or in Jerusalem or New York or Kansas City where I grew up. You ask Mrs. Goldberg, about Jesus, and immediately there's something in us called a negative commitment to the person of Jesus. Why negative? Oh, I don't know, maybe something like Crusades and Inquisition, maybe something like Hitler's Holocaust and the pogroms and Pamyat of Russia, maybe the anti-Semitism that fills the ABC and the BBC anytime there's an Israeli-Palestinian conversation. Maybe that has infected Jewish people's perspective of your Jesus. So immediately, you've got to know that you're climbing up a hill. You're not just walking across a field when you're discussing what you believe with Jewish people. 
Jewish people love, generally speaking, to answer questions even unasked. Let me tell you what I mean. Why you didn't ask? I'll tell you. So this whole idea of, of communicating what we believe, especially as we are tighter and tighter. I don't know about Tamworth. I don't know about Yass or Yay Victoria, but I do know that when you combine a whole tens of thousands of us, we become pretty opinionated. As a result, when you ask me a question like, who do I think Jesus is? The number one question we as Jews for Jesus go to. Most Jewish people will have an opinion. Well, I'll tell you, we don't believe in him. Okay, that's good to know. That wasn't my question, though. So when you start, if you will, knocking up against a fairly strong fence, you have to have some kind of commitment to that person. You have to have some kind of relationship with that person. So let me suggest this. Before you go up to Tom, Dick, and Shmuel inside the Eruv in Caulfield and you want to evangelize, hey, Rabbi, come here. Before you do that, maybe you should have a little bit, maybe a little bit of relationship with him. Maybe a little bit, like, hello, how are you? Before you go up, hi, Jew, would you like to convert? Something between zero and 100 would probably be a good idea. Now, how, how do you make friends with Jewish people? You know, oh, I don't know, I, li I live in uh, Budjawoy. I, I haven't seen a Jew in decades. Okay, well, maybe you need to, I don't know, leave Budjawoy. Maybe you need to leave Wyong and encounter some Jewish people. Go to Tuggera, go to the Westfield. Isn't there a Israeli uh, Dead Sea product thing? There probably. There are all over the country, all over the world. There are Jewish people who are mm, your captive audience. That may not be the best. but have a relationship. How do you make a relationship with a Jewish person? I would say complain. Complain, that's the best way. You, oh, it's so hot. I know, it's so humid. Can you believe it? It's 30 degrees. I know, yesterday it was beautiful, 20. What happened today? All of a sudden, you become best friends with your co-complainant. Uh, it doesn't take long, whether it's weather or Malcolm Turnbull's latest whatever. Uh, you can always complain about Julia. She's still around enough. Uh, or Joe Hockey. You can still complain about someone like Obama. Can you believe what Obama said about it? You know, immediately you've got a mate. And that mateship is not something you are using to get somebody somewhere. In other words, you are making a friend who's genuinely a friend and relate well to that friend. That's what people do. We are mates together. If you make a friend so that you can get something from them, that's pretty evil. That's called manipulation at best and prostitution at worst. So if you make a friend so that you can get something from them, that's not good. You make a friend because Jewish people are worthy of friendship. That's good. You make a friend of a Mrs. Anderson or Dr. Cheng. That's good because they're worthy of love, not because you want something from them. So don't love Jews so that you can win them to Christ. Love Jews because Jesus died for them, because they're worthy of his love and your love, et cetera. Does that make sense? Yeah. So here's some basis of relationship. One more thing. Prayer. I can't get away from it. I long for people to get it. I long for uh, my own life to be filled with it. I long when I encounter believers like you who want to bring the good news of Yeshua to Jewish people to be filled with and find friends who will join you in prayer. Because when they may not receive our prophetic word of preaching the word, they will almost always receive our priestly ministry of praying for them. There are Jewish people today who are believers. I know them personally because though they had a hostility towards the gospel in their beginning, they were softened because someone at a moment in their life when they were hurting, when they were needy, 
when they were alone, someone said, I'm praying for you. I will pray for you. May I pray for you? That kind of phrases. Don't worry the exact language. But when people say that, and more importantly, when they do that prayer, God does his work in drawing people to himself. I want to say, amen. I, I, want, I want you to shout that because, amen. quietly, because, uh, because without prayer, honestly, it's just mechanism. With prayer, it's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And people ask me regularly, so what's the best method of evangelism? And what I do and what I will do with you is to point you to the clearest way to confuse you I know. John chapter 3, one of my favorites, and I go here regularly with Jewish people. But I want you to see it as believers, as you, my guess, well know this story of the rabbi named Nicodemus, Nick at night, who came to Yeshua and who said to him that we know you're somebody special. You're from God. You, what you're doing, nobody can do what you're doing unless God's with him. And Yeshua tells him, you got to be born again. Just like that. Changes the whole dynamic. And he says, wait a minute, I'm an old guy. You want me to climb back into mom? No, no, no. You're not thinking. You're thinking naturally. I want you to think heavenly. Okay. The very next chapter is what was referenced earlier in our singing about the woman nicknamed the Bad Samaritan, who is there at a well and whom Yeshua approaches and shares of his own life with her, saying that he was the living water, that if she drank from him, she'd never be thirsty again. She said, "Woo, yes, give me that. So what's the best method to bring the good news to Jewish people? Well, you should wait at night until they approach you. Or you should go and approach them in the middle of the day. Or you should talk only to prominent people like rabbis. Or you should talk only to low life, rejected women. You should only, you should, do you get it? It's intentional. It's by design. There's not one way to do this. So how do we know what to do? You are led by the Holy Spirit. If you are going to do that, you better be in prayer. That said, what about ongoing regular evangelism? If you know anything about Jews for Jesus, and if you don't, I hope you'll pick up the newsletter up the back after the meeting, or those of you watching it among the thousands online will go to JewsForJesus.org. Wherever you are, if you're in Australia, add the .au and it'll go right to our site. But if you know anything about us, you know that we're out on the street corners handing out leaflets like this one. Christmas is a Jewish holiday, or at least it should be, because it's about the birth of the greatest Jew who ever lived. So we, we write about that in red and green and little chicken scratch from Moish Rosen back in the day when he wrote that. So why do I do that if I'm supposed to be led by the Spirit? Because part of what God has led me to continue is an ongoing forthright gospel proclamation among all people, including Jewish people, on the streets. You may not be called to do such a thing. Fair enough. Our brother and sister are wearing these gospel proclaiming t-shirts. Sometimes you might wear a badge. I'm a, I'm a Yeshua freak. Ask me how. Something like that. I don't know what you'll come up with. Uh, but somehow we are designed at one time or another whether with a, a little bold t-shirt or a gospel tract on the street or simply answering the next door neighbor when they ask, how is it you have so much peace? Whether we initiate it or they initiate it, our responsibility is to make it clear. So you have to know what it is, not the Jews think, but Mrs. Goldberg thinks. So what are you going to do to get there? You're going to ask questions. Ask Mrs. Goldberg, excuse me, Mrs. Goldberg, I, I just saw on the news, again, they're talking about stabbings in Israel. Do you, 
Do you know people over there? No, I don't. Okay. Um, do you think there will ever be peace there, Mrs. Goldberg? Well, I sure hope so. Yeah, I do too. How, Mrs. Goldberg, do you think that peace might come? So you're moving her along, if you will, in consideration of things she may have thought of and may have never even considered. Your job as a messianist, as a religionist, as an evangelist in this regard is to take her from wherever she is one more step along the path towards Messiah. Does that make sense? Don't worry about getting... Why, Rabbi, would you like to convert? You know, from negative nine to zero, boom, can you get here? But, Rabbi, have you ever read a portion of the Newer Testament? Rabbi, have you ever met a Jew who believes in Jesus? Mrs. Goldberg, uh, do you celebrate Hanukkah? Uh, what's that next holiday for Jewish people? Anything like that. So ask questions that we as Jewish people might answer the question. Now, sometimes... As you might know, Jewish people answer questions with questions. You'll see that in the scriptures when Yeshua does that. You'll see that in my life if you ask me something. Generally, I want to know who are you uh, or what's it about or why. Uh, you're not a liberal, are you? Why? What's it to you? What do you want to know for? That kind of thing. So we want to know who it is with whom we're, we're speaking. A couple weeks ago, I was at a conference in Padstow and afterwards went to Lakemba for dinner with a group and who felt very comfortable with a Lebanese restaurant in the middle of Lakemba. I drove my Jews for Jesus car and parked right in front of it. Those of you who are not from here don't know that Lakemba, well, it's, let's say, not very Jewish. Uh, it's extremely, it's the center of the Muslim community in Sydney anyway. Afterwards, I went into a store and I came back out and I was putting some groceries away when a young Islamist came over and said, can I help you, brother? I thought, where were you five minutes ago when I was putting stuff in? Anyway, I was, I was all set to say, no, 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 thanks, when I said, let me ask you a question. And we got into a conversation that lasted for two hours two hours, not only with him and me, but with another couple guys, and then another couple guys, and then we were up to seven guys, and then down to four, and up to three, and down for two hours, right there on the streets, in the shops, in Lakemba, it was the most lively, and really, to, for me, the, the longest evangelism conversation I'd ever had with uh, that many Islamists. In the middle of that, into that conversation, came a, a fairly hostile Muslim, who said, hey, are you a Zionist? And my, my natural reaction with someone who's hostile is, yeah, I don't want to carry on this convo. Uh, but I thought, no, I'm in the middle of this. This is fine. I said, uh, look, I'll answer your question, but tell me what you mean by Zionist. I know what I mean. I don't know what you mean. Well, immediately his hostility arose, his voice raised, and beautifully, Three of the other fellows chased him away because he wasn't being ironic as we were. I thought, this is holy. This is really great. But I, I use that as an example to help you see that answering a question with a question helps you understand what that guy really meant. So if you ask me if I'm a Zionist, I want to know what you mean, although most of you, I think I get it. Uh, if you ask me, am I liberal or labor, I want to know what's it to you. If you want to know if I barrack for the Newcastle Knights or the Gold, yeah, I'd say who cared. But anyway, here's a wooden spoon. Anyway, um, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, it's important to discuss with people where they are, not where they aren't all the while moving them towards where you want to go. Questions are a great way to lead conversations. You could preach. When I was a young lad, I went to synagogue. I was very orthodox in my Jewish life. And I remember as the youth group, we would probably fill, it was a huge sanctuary at our synagogue there in Missouri. And probably up the entire side, probably 100, 150 of us, 
from the youth group would be there every Sabbath. And when this three-hour service, so I don't want to hear you complain about your hour and a half now. Uh, the three-hour service, and we had to wear suits and ties. I don't know what you wear. So suits and ties. And there we were. And I remember just as the rabbi got up to speak, about two hours and 25 minutes, two hours, sorry, and 10 minutes into the service, the youth group left, just like that. A lot of old, older folk, too, to go out for a smoke. But the rabbi's 19-minute sermon was very calculable. You knew we could go. I went to the uh, tune shop, the, the 60s rock and roll, get the... It was like this, so like a DL size, and I'd pick up the top 40 survey to know where she loves you, yeah, 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 was in the, in the top 40 survey that week. Uh, we'd go there, we'd come back, and we'd stand by the door, and as soon as the rabbi finished his drush, his sermon, we'd go back in for the final prayer service of the day. I use that as an image to help you understand that when somebody stands up to preach in a pulpit, or you stand up to speak to Mrs. Goldberg, uh, I have some information I'd like to pass on to you about the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Knock, knock, knock. May I pass on to you words about the kingdom? Things like that. Uh, may I read to you from our holy book? Immediately, it's the invisible pulpit that I remember from my youth, and whether they leave or don't, they are gone from listening to you. <laughs> Welcome to silence. Questions, however, will always be met with some kind of answer which tells you something. So when I say, how about asking them, who do you think Jesus is? Then I say, then they answer me, well, look, we don't believe in him. Yeah, yeah, fine, that's not what I asked, but I appreciate knowing that. So no, 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 who do you think Jesus is? Well, uh, Jesus, what would they say? He was a good man, he was a prophet, he was a teacher, he was like a Gandhi with a kippah. They really don't know because they've never really read not only the pages of the Older Testament, but certainly not your, it's not half, is it? Your side of the Bible, which by the way is still my side. I don't know how you got in on this. All right. <laughs> Matthew's writing to a bunch of Goyim in the Central Coast. I don't think so. Well... <laughs> So when you ask them about Jesus, already they're a little disoriented, they're a little frustrated, a little flustered, and you've got to be gracious to them. Here's what I mean. If you ask someone, for, for instance, some of you might have been uh, Roman Catholic in your youth. If you ask a Roman Catholic about religion, who, a Roman Catholic who has not been going to church lately, who has not been going to confession, who doesn't practice with the Hail Marys and the rosaries and all the religious activity, what do they feel when you mention religion? Guilt. So when you step on somebody's guilt-filled toes, they're not exactly happy about continuing the conversation. Does that make sense? So when you ask Mrs. Goldberg about who she thinks Jesus is, and she doesn't know, she says, I don't know. Okay, fine, you don't know. If you did want to know, where would you go for that information? Would you go to a rabbi, a priest? Would you go to Jews for Jesus website? Would you go to the Bible? Would you come to me? Would you come to my church? What would you do? And that's when you're listening to what she says so that you can help her go to negative seven or negative six. I was witnessing to a, a Jewish fellow in Israel, in Jerusalem in August. I was sitting in his cab, we were in the old city, we were driving from one place to another, and I start sharing the good news of Yeshua with him in my broken Hebrew and his broken English. We got it, it was good. And he tells me, his name was Shaul, Saul. And he tells me, five minutes into this, and just moments before he drops me off, you sound just like my friend Moshe. And I thought he was talking about Moses, the author of the first five books of the Bible, so I said, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher. He said, no, 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 my friend Moshe, who's been telling me the same thing you're telling me. And I think, how good is this? That my witness and Moshe's witness and whoever's next is going to keep on that gospel witness. 
Three days later, I was witnessing to another driver. This time his name is Etal Tal. And I'm sharing with him as he drives me all the way from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv. You know how far that is. It's a good long distance. And we're driving and I'm witnessing, I'm driving. I mean, he's driving, I'm witnessing. Telling him the whole story. <laughs> At the end, I say to him, you know, is there any good reason why you shouldn't accept Yeshua now? And he said, well, I'd rather my friend, and he names a fellow who's a Jewish believer whom I know, I'd rather he does this for me. Like he's thinking that he's the doctor, he's going to do the surgery, or he's, he's going to get a commission, and I, I don't know. <laughs> I was fairly disappointed. My friend Avi, who was sitting in the back seat, said, I thought for sure he was going to make a profession of faith. And I was pretty disappointed. Until two weeks ago, when I got an email from the wife of the Jewish believer, who's also a Jewish believer in Israel, who knows Etal, in fact, who just prayed with Etal to profess Jesus as Messiah. And I thought, this is so awesome. I don't know what place I played. I don't care. Don't you care? Well, did you pray with them? Did you leave? Because negative nine to zero, there's a lot of room. I was an old maths teacher. Form, sorry, I'm not old. I was a former maths teacher. I'm not soliciting tutorials for your kids' HSC. I'm just saying that there are a lot of numbers between negative 9 and 0 on the angle scale. There's a lot of room for people to move up. And I look forward to helping your Goldbergs and your Blumenthal's come to faith. A year and a half ago, I was at the SCG for a footy match between somebody, I don't know, Swans probably. And I got a phone call from an Israeli woman. I'd never met her. And someone had given her my number. Okay. Talked to her. It's loud. But I heard her. And she was looking for a place to stay. Okay, I don't work in that field, but I've got friends, and let me see what I can do. She was in Sydney. She had to get out of her housing that next morning. Hmm, why is this my job? Anyway, I don't know, so I said, I'll work on it. Made a couple phone calls, found someone who said, sure, we'll take her. That's great. I rang her back, said, I can organize, I've organized that for you. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna be speaking, this was a Saturday, I'm gonna be speaking that next day in the neighborhood where this couple lives. I'll be happy to come and fetch, to collect you from where you are in the city and take you out northwest and take you out there if you want to come with. In fact, you could come to church with me. She said, okay, why not? Israeli. So I took her and uh, gave a sermon that day and she was on her phone texting or Facebooking the entire sermon. Maybe the whole service, I, I wasn't sure, because I was sitting up front. And I was so disappointed, I thought, this is really a good sermon. That she ought to be listening. And Jesus was doing stuff, and you know, she didn't hear a word. Afterwards, it was right after Pesach, and as a result, she was longing for bread. <laughs> so I said, where would you like to go to eat before the family welcomes you? She said, McDonald's. <laughs> I thought, Maccas, really? We're going to go? Okay, fine. So we go to McDonald's, and she asks me a question that precipitates an entire long explanation of what it is I really believe. She kept asking questions as I kept answering from Genesis all the way through, if you will, Jesus in the Old Testament. It was almost a, an entire sermon again, but it was really question, answer, question, answer. She'd been a lawyer, she was a lawyer. I guess she still is, in her 20s. So I drop her off at the house, say goodbye, yada, yada, done. The next Sunday, unlike almost any other week, I'm back in the same neighborhood, literally five minutes away from the previous church at another church. That never happens. If you follow me on Facebook or look at our website, you'll see... Who knows what country I'll be in next week, much less the, the same state, much less the same postcode. 
But there I was in the same place. And the woman of the house and my friend Nancy came along to hear me speak a second time now. This is great. This time she's not on her phone as much. This time I give a pretty decent message. And afterwards, the pastor of the church comes up and makes a call for communion. Those of you who are believers in Jesus, come on up, etc. And it was just moments later when it was that pew, and sure enough, Nancy comes out of her pew and comes up and takes the matzah, that's what they used, and a bit of grape juice. And I'm sitting on the platform thinking, oh my God, she's not going to die or anything. The lightning's not going to hit, but oh, she didn't get it right. It's okay. So she goes back, sits down, and I just get up because I'd already taken, and I go down to where she's sitting, and I say, you know, you really weren't supposed to take that unless you were a believer. She said, oh, no, no, I am now. Said, oh, great. Zero. When did that happen? She said, remember last week at McDonald's? No, I mean, yeah, of course I remember, but I had no idea that at that moment, she who was darkened in understanding was seeing the light of the glory of the gospel of Yeshua. Right in the middle of Q&A over McDonald's, a Jewish lawyer gives her life to Jesus. There's just something about it that says to me, we can't plan it. It's up to God. We have to be responsible to do what? Share what we believe. And you can do that in answers, or you can do that in questions. And as long as you're being faithful in prayer and forthright communication, God will do his work. One of the most disingenuous, and I want to say insidious activities of the church is to love on Jews to fulfill their own need for the second coming of Christ. Well, if we love Israel and if we send them all to Israel, which I don't know where they get that, but if, I, if we somehow here, here's a plane ticket, move to Israel, Jesus will come back then. What bad theology is that, although it's great for Qantas. Uh, when, when we do such a thing, then we are really dismissing our responsibility to go into all the world and Hmm. preach the gospel to all creatures. St. Francis took that so seriously, he sang to birds, just talk to Jews. I'm not asking you to talk to your lorikeets. Uh, feel free to do so. But it is an important responsibility the church has to go ahead and perform what Yeshua, Jesus, told us to do, beginning at Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and Lakemba. So when we are going to share, whether we wear a bold t-shirt or we merely offer a flyer or invite someone to a Jewish Bible class, there are lots of those around in the Central Coast and in the city, and you invite them to meet a Jewish believer, that's always a good thing. Whenever you move your own comfort level out of where it is and push that envelope, towards, yikes, did I really just invite her to read the Bible with me next Tuesday over lunch? Yeah, if you do that, then you better have a couple good mm, Bible quotes to say, these are things that I found that really matter to me. And I'd like to ask, what do you think about this? If you do that, you are helping Mrs. Goldberg to encounter the living God. Look, there are all kinds of helps. I'm going to recommend two angles for evangelizing Jewish people. Two different angles. You can't get away from it however you do it. This, by the way, is a teaching guide called Witnessing to Jews. This was written by Moish and Seal Rosen. Moish, founder of Jews for Jesus. He died five years ago on Pentecost. Um, it's got a leader's guide. It's got a DVD. Yep. DVD's still in there. Uh, it's a great packet for you and a small group to go through and learn and study what we can do. The DVD is great because it has encounters between a Jewish believer uh, or between a believer and a Jewish person, not a believer, and what they do right, what they do wrong. It's really a great mm, hands-on sort of. At least you're in the seminar along with them. So I, I recommend that. 
But there are two angles, I would say, of evangelism that really will matter. And that is apologetics and testimony. If you will use those at your discretion, at the Holy Spirit's guidance, then you will be successful, I really believe. So my testimony, which I think is mostly true. No, I think it's uh, pretty good. Uh, called Who Ever Heard of a Jewish Missionaries on the Not-So-Free Side of the Table. It is really how an Orthodox Jew like me, full on in my Jewish practice, encountered Jesus freaks, as we lovingly called them, and they encountered me, challenged me with my faithlessness. I had my own difficulties because of seeing my sin, what you call conviction of sin. I didn't know that term, but my own inability to change at 19 years old, and then hearing the good news from some friends, and three days later gave my life to Jesus. So it doesn't take long. It might be as long as Nancy, <laughs> it might be as long as me, or my grandmother who 20 years took before she finally heard it, heard it, heard it, heard it again. And at 96, she gave her life to Jesus. 96, never give up on people. Testimony and apologetics. What's apologetics? You're not sorry, you're not apologizing. It is the discussion of what's true in the Bible and making a defense about it. So you can say, Mrs. Goldberg, I really want to answer your question about suffering. I really want to explain to you why you are so hurting because of your father-in-law dying in the Holocaust. I really want to answer that. Do you really want me to? Because the number one issue Jewish people will raise is Holocaust suffering, pain. What kind of God would let Jewish people suffer, six million of us, then or now? Uh, my, my aunt uh, Tilly got to 49 years of married life and then her husband dies. What kind of God lets her have that? You think, really? 49's not a bad inning, sweetheart. But everybody's got a reason why they're blaming the God in whom they don't believe. Who says that's consistent? Yeah. And who says consistency matters to most Jewish people? No, we have this blame on God who left us in the lurch. Mo to most Jewish people, there is no God. There will not be a Messiah. Because if, he were, if there were, he should have come already. Since he didn't, there, he, he's out. He's fired. This is the apprentice. You're fired. <laughs> and that's real. And there's ex there are explanations. What are you going to use to explain that? That's what you have to work out from Bible, from testimony, both of those alike. Let's say they do come to faith and they say, all right, all right, I believe Jesus is the Messiah. I read Isaiah 53, Daniel 9, Micah 5. All right, I get it, I get it. Jesus, Messiah, good, good, shmud. Uh, what does that have to do with me? I'm Jewish. Well, what do you mean? Well, the Messiah, that's a Jewish thing. Look, that's a Christian Messiah. So now you have to back up and show from Genesis 3 the Messiah was going to be one of our boys. And he wasn't going to be the Gentile Messiah and we'll have a Jewish one. We'll have one for everybody. Everybody should not be left out. You have yours, we'll have ours. We'll get along fine past the sweet potatoes. This is not the way it works. There's one Messiah, one God, one life for all of us. So how do you get there? You have to have biblical answers. And uh, we've got plenty of resources, and Dan's got plenty of resources, Paul's got resources. We can all help you get some resources that'll be useful to those who really ask the real questions. Then get them to meet a real Jew who's really found the real Jesus, whether on YouTube or MeTube or iTube or whatever color tube you're on, it doesn't matter. Anywhere you can get them to meet a real person who really loves the real Jesus. That's what you want. Let them come hear a speaker at a neighborhood church who's a Jewish believer. Give them a book, a testament, anything. Forbidden Peace, Great DVD, things like that. If you can get Jewish people to meet a real Jew who really give a real listen, then they're up to negative five, to negative four. Do you see how it works? Don't be sad about how far they are. Look at the progression and get enthused. Watch what God does as you pray 
and other people pray as well. I have, as you would imagine, a few more things to say and no time to say it. That's all right. I'm happy to be a help to you in the months and years to come. So Google or email or pick up a phone. They have these things called phones. You could actually call people. It's pretty cool. And they have numbers on it. You don't dial anymore, but you push. And you can call me. And I'll be happy to talk to you unless I'm in the middle of a lecture. But we'll be talking and I'll help you with your Goldbergs, with your Blumenthal's, and maybe that'll help you with your Andersons and Murphys. Because if you can witness to Jews, you can witness to anybody. Lord, help my brothers and sisters as we continue to try to serve you here. Take the words that we said today as an encouragement for them that they might take it on board and move one step further, one more step bolder in sharing what they believe. God, help us to be your witnesses in Jerusalem and Lakemba and everywhere in between. We trust you in Yeshua's name. Amen.